Well, before we get going on to a message, whenever I hear a prayer request before the, from anybody in the middle of service, I'm always compelled to pray then and not wait. Because going my mind, I can't even look at it unless somebody reminds me. So actually, let's go ahead and stand for a moment. With the blood flowing. Um, Nelson's sister uh, has a, uh, a, a nice little surprise of uh, being a little bit more advanced in years and, and now uh, having a uh, bun in the oven, shall we say. And so just praying that everything goes all right with the pregnancy, because as we know, uh, once you're over 40, things can go south and some things can happen. So let's go ahead and pray together. Lord, we just pray for us as sister, Lord, uh, that you've given them this bundle of joy, and yet it's <clears throat> very challenging and very demanding. And Lord, many things can go wrong. We thank you that so far everything, the blood tests seem to be perfectly all right. But Lord, we know many complications can come during this pregnancy. Lord, I just pray that you would be with the family and be with her. Give the doctors and nurses wisdom and knowledge on how to be able to help best take care of her and the baby. Lord, uh, each and every life is precious. But Lord, it's, it's harder and it's uh, even more a surprise when you don't think that you're going to be, become pregnant. Lord, I pray that they would <coughs> find joy in and through this process. And there might be a blessing to the family. We <coughs> thank you ahead of time and what you are going to do in and through the family. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. If you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 John chapter 3. Pick up in verse 3 where we left off. Thank God for Ricola. That's the only way I can talk right now. And I know Arthur is about the, the same way. It's just somehow, inevitably, in a small town like ours, if, some, if one person gets sick, it just starts spreading and spreading. And I'm, I don't know if I got it from Arthur or someone else. All I know is uh, I'm the first one in my little family to get sick. And, and the girls are just stuck with me. First John chapter 3, verse 3. And invariably... As a side note, I'm covering for my friend Dr. Howard in his daily internet program and his TV program once a week. And of course, once I said, yes, okay, I'll, I can cover for you, of course, I get sick. First John chapter 3, verse 3. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. <clears throat> this is one of those passages in the English I really wish... They would have capitalized the he <clears throat> in the purifies himself as he is pure, speaking back of Christ and not of ourselves. And there's a small church in the town in which we came from in California. It was a little tiny, uh, way smaller than this church. And it always seemed like they were closed. They were never open. But in talking with some people in town, they believed in what's called sinless perfection. In other words, that Jesus' blood and sacrifice on the cross cleanses us so much and that as we become more and more like him, eventually we no longer sin. It is their doctrine, it is their teaching. And yet, what is it we already saw in First John? He who says he does not have sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. And what is Paul said, Paul says he's the chief of sinners. If John and Paul could not claim to be sinless, how much do we think that we can claim to be sinless, to achieve this sinless perfection? I was thinking about that this week and wondering if we believe that we've arrived, if we've gotten to the place that we no longer sin. Doesn't that detract from, from the gloriousness that heaven will be? That there's no more sin, no more death, no more sickness. But if you already take away the concept of not sinning anymore, 
Doesn't that detract from how glorious heaven will be? Not only as we've already looked at the fact that Paul and John say that that's impossible. If I were to come up before you this morning and to say, Chris doesn't sin, I would be a liar. I would much more identify with Paul and say I'm the chief of sinners before anything else. See, if anyone, then I think this is the main reason why non-Christians have such a hard time with Christianity. Because they see that we claim to be Christians and worship someone who is perfect, who is sinless, and yet we ourselves are not. That great dichotomy that, that exists <clears throat> excuse me, between the followers of Christ and, and Jesus himself. When instead, we should tell our unsaved friends and family, you know what, yes, we are hypocrites in the true sense of the word. Hypocrite in the Greek is the, the idea of an actor who's on stage. And what they would do is, so that they didn't have multiple... 10, 20, 30 actors to play different parts. What they would do is they would go off stage where there was a selection of masks for them to put on. And depending if it was the same character, but a different, if they were sad or if they were angry, they would grab that mask, put it on, and then come back onto the stage so that the audience could tell that the nature of the person has changed or that they're in a different character. And that's what our unsafe friends are seeing with us. They're seeing that Christians, above anybody, often wear masks. That they are true hypocrites in that they wear a mask on Sunday. And then they wear a mask on Monday. And the rest of the week. Not, not to mention whatever other masks they wear. It's almost as though we as Christians have a chester drawer and we open up one drawer and there's nine or ten masks and we get to choose, okay, what's my mask for the day? No wonder it's rightly so that our unsafe family and friends can call us hypocrites because they haven't been able to understand who the real person is deep down. Who it is, is who is have their heart of stone taken away and given a heart of flesh. Maybe it's a defense mechanism. Maybe it's us not wanting to get hurt. But the biggest thing I have found in church is for the church to become authentic, real. And that's the only way people that are outside of these four walls are going to be willing and wanting to come in. I was a part of a youth group for a number of years, and one of my good friends was the, the pastor of that group. And I was just there to kind of help him. And he started with nine young adults, like we have on Wednesday nights. Well, we have one night on Wednesday nights, but young adults on Wednesday nights. And we had a room about this size, ended up over one summer having 80 young adults in there. Not because of anything special he or I did, but the group in it, at its core wanted to be authentic. Wanted to take off those masks and to destroy them and to, to burn them. Whether fi figuratively or literally. That group of people shared their hurts and their failures. They, they shared their triumphs and their sins. That group became very, very strong, and unfortunately, it was forces from the outside that caused it to collapse. But that group of people could have stood before you today and, said, and clearly stated, I am a broken sinner in need of a Savior. That I have only appeared to you as a Christian because of what He has done and the great exchange of my righteousness to His righteousness my sin to his perfection is the only way any of those young men and women could have presented themselves before you this morning. And it's the same way that that 
<clears throat> has affected me. See, <clears throat> for many in here, we don't understand our young adults' culture. There's a lot of buzzwords, a lot, a lot of words that get thrown out like being authentic and real. And yet that is what they so desperately crave because they've grown up in a society that, that instead pushes us towards going to the masks. Pretending to be one person on Sunday and one person the rest of the week. Even though we're told not to, the society still pushes you towards that. And yet the younger generation, those born since, let's say, 2000, really want and desire authentic relationships without barriers, authentic uh, communion without having masks. And yet that is entirely why Jesus came. Jesus came to break down the barriers so that you can be real in front of people, that you can, in fact, be a sinner in need of a savior and not be looked at as uh, some kind of heathen. And yet that's hard in our culture. Anyone born before the year 2000, we've been taught not to trust other people, not to expose our vulnerable sides, our vulnerable selves, to, to really discuss and pray with people and say, hey, you know, I'm dealing with this this week. Pray for me. Now, if you grew up in the church, that's different. But for those born, let's say, before the year 2000 that have been in the world, they totally have a trust issues with other people. They've been hurt too many times. Thus, it's hard for them when they come into a church such as this to trust people. They see the portrayals of Christians on the TV, the radio, and the internet, and they say, oh, look at this bunch of hypocrites. They've never really had somebody sit down with them and expose themselves to, to put down the masks, to have them sit down and have a cup of coffee and go, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I have a great Savior. I, I'm not righteous in and of myself. I have been given Christ's righteousness. These are the types of conversations we need to have at the coffee tables at Jenny's and in our homes with those that we love the most. For them to be able to see us take off our masks and to put them to the side so that they can see Christ in us rather than us covering up. As Jesus said, who lights a candle and puts a bushel over it? No. Just as the kids' song goes, uh, this little light of mine I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. What's interesting is I'm finding that the Bible memory songs that I learned as a kid, as we continue to go through the scriptures, keep coming and reminding me that I may not have known the verse, but I knew the idea well before I read it in the scriptures. That's why on Mondays and on Wednesdays at release time, imparting, even if it's just learning the songs for the sake of learning the songs that, that might affect our kids at a future point in time, such as in going through some of the songs that my daughters go through, that remembering of the times in which people sat down with me to, to teach me about God's Word and were real with me and, and truly loved me. Those are the type of experiences we need to take from our past and to imprint them onto other people. To remember what it was to feel loved and have authentic relationships and then purposely have that with other people. Designed to tell people from the very beginning, I want to have a, a real relationship with you, not one with masks, not one with deceit. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. We're going to get into a discussion here a little bit this morning about the difference between falling into sin and practicing sin. See, most of the world that looks at us 
thinks that we are ones who practice sin, who purposefully, willingly, excuse me, maliciously plan our steps throughout the week and, and continue in the same sin that has constantly beset us. Versus the reality is that those that are in Christ, instead of practicing sin, fall into it. If we are following Christ and looking towards Him, as I walk on this road, because I'm looking at Him, sometimes I will not see the hole that's under my feet. Just like I totally meant, totally did not see a huge pothole this week. I was just driving along, and I guess I was distracted. I was focused way too far ahead. And the girls were with me, and they got a nice little, uh, very short um, carnival ride through, in and through a pothole. I am praying and hoping that the wind didn't get bent. But that's the same way sin occurs in, in a Christian's life is that as we're following Christ, as I'm walking towards Him, I know that this ledge is here, but if I'm so focused on the direction I'm going, I am going to fall into the, this next set of mistakes, this, this trap that's at my feet. That is to be not practicing sin, but to fall into it. See, the world is right in going and pointing out the Christians that are practicing lawlessness, that, that are captive to sin. See, there's going to be a great dichotomy that John makes here, that between John 3, 4 and John 3, 6. Is there's a difference between being held captive to sin and falling into it. To habitually, continually practice it, and then it becomes lawlessness. This concept is called poiel in the Greek. And it occurs not only here in John, but in a lot of Paul's writings. We know that we struggle with sin. We can look at that in uh, Romans chapter 7. But Paul says that we've been delivered from being captive to sin, but instead to being servants of righteousness. So then how then do we go from being captives to sin to being free and just uh, sometimes falling into sin. It all depends on where we have our eyes. Are our eyes upon Jesus? Are we in His Word? Are we praying? Or are we instead blind to those things and, and walking around in the world like Christy tells me I walk? Sometimes Christy has to nudge me because if we're walking around town or something, often I, I'm looking down looking where my feet are going because I hate tripping and falling and with the way my back is I don't want to fall. And Christy has to constantly nudge me and go, look up, get, get your head up, stop looking at the ground. And in many ways as Christians we're so concerned about not falling into sin that sometimes we forget to look up and, and to look to the cross. Where is that balance? Where is not only looking at the path that God has put out before us, but also looking at the cross? That fine line between living in the world but not being of it. You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. Oh. This week I was in one of my presentations for my friend Dr. Howard show. I went through some early false teachers. And one of them said that Jesus was a sinner and that he had also married Mary and Martha in order to ascend to being God himself. This is within the first two centuries of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Theology matters. He appeared in order to take away sins. No wonder John the Baptist could say, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. That Lamb that would actually that same week be sacrificed in the temple to take away people's and to cover their sin for 
that year. Had we inspected, had no spot or blemish or birth defect, had to be absolutely as perfect as it could be in order to be sacrificed. And yet to hear in the same sentence those that claim that Jesus was the spotless lamb and then also to say that he had sin. One of those things just doesn't belong with the other. See, if we have a sinful Savior, then we have no Savior at all. As I was mentioning, mentioning a number of weeks ago with Serethius, if Jesus didn't have a body and flesh and blood, we have no Savior. If the Lamb that is to be slain has no blood, there's no remission for sins. We looked at many verses about without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. But what if that Lamb is imperfect? What if the Lamb actually had sin? It wasn't accepted to be the sacrifice. So all of our religious friends that say that Jesus is somehow just a man and a sinner, that as Paul says, we are to be pitied above all other men. To believe in just another man to be sacrificed for the rest of us, his blood wouldn't be enough for our sins. No wonder our friends down the street who deny the full sufficiency of the sacrifice of Christ, continue by saying, that, well, if you're in the church and, and you've done all these good things, but you still do something bad like kill somebody, the, that blood price is still upon your head and your, your blood needs to be shed in order to atone for it. Interestingly enough, and there was a family and one of the sons had committed a murder. And just before... Um, he was going to be sentenced. The family had asked the judge to actually assign a shooting squad. Oddly enough, still on the books in Utah, he can be executed by firing squad. So, because of certain theological preferences that go into that. So the family was hoping that their son, guilty of the crime, and though he was, was going to get the firing squad and they were asking for it because then his blood would be spilt in order to atone for the crime, not Jesus. Theology matters, people. It's amazing how this comes up and when the son didn't get the death penalty, his family was upset because they believed that he, that he would spend time in spirit prison rather than um, ascend, ascend to Godhood because his blood wasn't spilt for him spilling someone else's blood. He appeared in order to take away sins. No wonder then that Jesus said, it is finished. Not it's partially done. Not it's kind of sort of done. But in fact, he has accomplished it. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. This is the dichotomy between poieo and abiding is so great, not only within John's writing, but within Paul's writing as well. That they call us to abide in him. More than seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, those who love me will abide with me. Those that follow me will abide with me. What is that abiding? An old English term that actually still continues in some of our modern translations. Is looking to the cross and seeing that it is the only way between God and man. Of clinging to the cross. We have a modern worship song that says, Take me to the cross where my Savior died. That is where we need to be if we are abiding in Him. Realizing that we have received the great exchange. Our hearts of stone for hearts of flesh. Because according to Paul in Romans 3, no one seeks after God. No one. No one that is righteous. No, not one. And yet, our friends in Southern California 
thought that they could become sinlessly perfect of their own doing and through their own righteousness. I have a martial arts friend who changes his other titles quite often. One week he's apostle, and one week he's prophet, and one week he's uh, bishop, and uh, whatever other titles he wants to give himself. But he goes to churches all across America and South America and goes into them and says, well, you, you can be perfect too. All you need to do is do these things over here and give some more money to the church and, and you have to speak in tongues and you've got to do all these things. And then, then, you're, then you, in and of yourself, your righteousness becomes perfect and then you no longer sin. Um, I just keep reminding them, uh, what did John say about that? What did, what did Paul say about that? If Paul and John could say that there were sinners in need of a Savior, and they continue sinning, then we can say the same thing today. Am I better than Paul or John? Uh, that's for sure. But he who keeps on sinning, he who keeps walking the road away from God, does not know God, has neither seen Him nor know Him. That is why I'm so thankful that instead of being a Romans 3 person who does not know God, who does not seek to know God, and in fact rebels against God, that God has instead drawn me to Himself, taken my heart of flesh for heart, heart of stone for heart of flesh. That Romans 10 9 could be true of me today rather than Romans 3. That I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord and I was saved. Past tense. Finished, complete, in Christ, not in myself. Not in doing anything or completing anything or of adding any type of work to it. Any type of work I try and put onto the, the fire just gets burned up. No wonder it is the great difference between Cain and Abel's sacrifice. One that could be, in fact, reclaimed and reused. Versus one that was truly a sacrifice that he could not, in fact, reclaim, redeem, or recover. The lamb that was slain when they're burned up, the meat's gone, the wool's gone, the blood is gone. There's nothing to reproduce, nothing to continue on. Versus the grain sacrifice, some grains can be burned and still use and planted and harvested. Many times we approach God with grain instead of a full sacrifice. We approach God and say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this, I'll, I'll give you my life, but you know, I, only, I want someone to do that. Instead of being like Abel and giving of the lamb that was slaughtered in which he could not bring it back to life. He could not harvest the rest of the meat. It could not reproduce and to bring him more lamb offspring. That is abiding. <clears throat> Versus when we bring something other than Christ and his righteousness alone before God, it's as though it is the grain offering and wanting something back in return. Of saying, oh God, yes, I, I need you to, to start the work of salvation. Yes, I'll believe in the cross, but your grace is only efficient to me after all I can do, as friends down the street say. After all I can do? Isn't everything that I can do nothing but filthy rags? And it's actually quite a bit more disgusting than that. Isn't everything that Chris can do just to be burnt up in the fire? Yeah. So how can I say that God's grace is sufficient for me after all that I can do? Does that not take away from Jesus' glory when he says, it is finished? Yeah, it does. 
so thankful that this is not me. So glad that the next verse is more true of us than no. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. The good things that are, I do are not because Chris is perfect. Because Chris is righteous. No, instead, Chris is a dirty, rotten scoundrel who has been covered in the grace of Christ who then does good things because he's saved, not in order to be saved. That's the vast difference between us and many that are on the outside. Many that would just say, like my parents would say, oh, you know, Chris, you're a pastor at church because, you know, you're trying to work that good deed stuff. No. I do good things because of the one who loved me, who sacrificed on the cross some 2,000 years ago. So that the great exchange could take place of my filthy rags for his beautiful white robes. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you that I'm no longer a Romans 3 person. That in fact, I'm a child of God. Called according to your purposes, your plan and your promise. God, I thank you that Romans 10, 9 was true in my life at, at a specific, pivotal point. Lord, I pray that we could tell that and show that to the rest of our community. That they could see that, yes, we are sinners in need of a Savior, but you are that great Savior. That they can exchange their works and they're trying so hard to be good instead for the righteous robes of Christ. Lord, now as we go throughout our day, as we go throughout our week, Lord, I pray that you would bless us and that you would keep us. That you make a face shine upon us. You give us peace this week. That we can rest in knowing that as we seek to abide in you, we will step further and further away from being ones who practice lawlessness. God, we thank you that that is true. It has been true. It is true. And it will be true of those who call you Lord. We praise you and we thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do this week. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.